Earth Day 1994, an ordinary-looking transit bus wheeled its way around Washington, D.C., and began what many observers consider nothing less than a sensation. This is the technology we need to really get us going. Uh, the people who look at technology and tell us where we should place our bets have looked at fuel cells and said, get on with them. Uh, we could do better in our department in terms of the money we put behind this, <laughs> in, this technology. Yeah, sure. And I think I get the message that <laughs> next year I've got to think harder about this. I am Great. delighted uh, to cut this ribbon. And uh, is somebody going to let me ride this bus? Yes. All right, let's go for a ride. <laughs> This bus is a quintessential example of high technology in, a, in practical use. And I'm sure that this is the first new technology vehicle that has been put into the uh, mix that seems to have direct applicability now, direct saleability now, and I think it's going to create a sensation. The American Public Transit Association Conference attracted a crowd ready for fuel cells. With the Clean Air Act requirements, if we really want to clean up the environment, this is the kind of technology that we ought to be looking at, and we need to, we need to push it into the industry. All of, us, all of us need to get on board. Compared with diesels, fuel cells produce only half the greenhouse gases, 250 times fewer carbon monoxides, practically no nitrogen oxides, and zero particulates. We think the fuel cell technology uh, is ultimate you know, in that direction. So we're very supportive of the project and hoping that uh, we can see uh, fleets of buses um, very soon that will be utilizing that technology on our streets. These are the developers. And they're demonstrating their bus to those who know buses best, the nation's transit operators. The fuel cell system has very few moving parts. The fuel cell generator itself, the fuel cell stack, is static. There's nothing that moves, it just generates electricity. And the amount of auxiliary components that use moving parts are very small and very simple. So everything that points to this aspect is that it's going to be a lot cheaper and a lot easier to maintain. Now, one thing that's amazing, if you want to get appreciation for the sound level of this bus, walk around here. Now, I brought you around here because this, the door's still open. Okay. This thing's still running. And this is a noisy side, because this is the exhaust side of the bus. So, amazing. amazing. <laughs> and that's your exhaust, uh, nothing but water vapor coming out of there. I'm amazed. This takes it uh, to another level. You're at another quantum shell. You're, uh, you've taken a, uh, a quantum leap. This is a, a dramatic change. I think, you know, we've always heard stories that it's going to, you know, that fuel cell won't be developed for another 10 years. And I think this proves that it's running. And it's, and it works. And I think, in, you know, when it becomes commercially available, I think it'll be a very popular, popular bus. Fuel cells were developed by the U.S. in the 1960s for use in the Gemini and Apollo missions. Today, fuel cells provide the space shuttle with all its electric needs. So how does it work? Like a battery, a fuel cell has electrodes, an electrolyte, and produces electricity. The difference is that a fuel cell produces power as long as hydrogen and oxygen are supplied. No recharging is needed. Here's how it works in the bus. Methanol and water are fed into a fuel processor. There, the mixture is reformed into a hydrogen-rich gas, which immediately enters the fuel cell. Upon contacting the anode, electrons are freed, starting the flow of electricity. The hydrogen ions then travel across the electrolyte to the cathode, where they recombine with the freed electrons and with oxygen from the air, forming electricity to power the drive motor. Water and heat are released as byproducts. This is the first of its kind in the world with the methanol operation. I think we are uh, maybe another two years or two and a half, three years away uh, from, from commercialization. You can see the system is very compact. It needs some, no, some simplification. There's some improvements that we know we can make. We've already gone ahead and we've made some lists 
uh, of improvements that we'd like to see in follow-up fuel cells. For instance, different ways to make the fuel cell lighter, uh, easier to maintain, and those modifications would be made in the next generation of fuel cells. Is there room on the site for that? Yeah, just behind this panel over here we could move the CO2 unit, mm -hmm. and that would be direct access then. Part of the purpose of this particular bus is to put it in the hands of the operators, and we'll get feedback from the operators in terms of what the next design really should be. The fuel cell bus is considered a hybrid in that more than one energy source provides power to the motor. In this case, a fuel cell and batteries. When idling, the batteries are charged by the fuel cell. While running, the fuel cell provides primary electric power to drive the motor, with the batteries providing peak power for acceleration and hill climbing. While cruising, most of the fuel cell power drives the motor. Any excess charges the batteries. When braking, power is regenerated from the motor to charge the batteries. The fuel cell continues charging. The energy that would normally be dissipated in the brakes is now returned to the batteries in terms of electrical, in, in electrical form, and we also reduce the wear and tear on the brakes. So it's not unusual for the electric drive buses to get two or three years of operation on a set of brakes. We see that fuel cells will be the prime mover for the next century. Before retiring, Rich Davis of LA County MTA introduced a fleet of over 300 methanol buses, creating an infrastructure which will facilitate the introduction of fuel cells. To characterize the economics of it is, is that methanol is, is cheap to get into. The infrastructure is relatively cheap. And that, I think, will be a big plus to the project. So I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's, uh, you know, we're, we need to get the bus out. We need to get it running. We need to have it on the streets. That's right. I think that fuel cells, you know, are very near being commercially available. Uh, we've got 10 operating at stationary sources in Los Angeles. Now we have two buses. Uh, operating very effectively, uh, so I think, I think they are realistic. We want to improve the condition of the environment for our kids and for ourselves, and at the same time, we want to stimulate the U.S. economy because we want to be winners internationally in both those areas. We have the opportunity to go for it, and uh, it's going to happen because the public insists. And Capitol Hill is beginning to listen. It will lead the way into solving that infrastructure problem for the fuel cell later on. We need to make that commitment and try to shorten that cycle. It, it, it's going to require commitment, and at, I, by that I mean both a philosophical commitment and also a financial commitment on the part of the U.S. government to make that happen. In an uncertain environment, you need government support. With the combined effort to support the development of the fuel cell, uh, I think we're in essence putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, and trying to make sure that we can provide a kind of su support that will shorten the cycle. We've got to be the initiator, and that is what we're doing here with this new fuel cell technology. By being the instigator, being the initiator, being the catalyst that helps it become a reality. People are very concerned about their environment, and people are very concerned about air quality in particular. I think the American people have been longing for a technology like the fuel cell technology that will bring us cars and buses and other vehicles that don't pollute at all. The fact is we can do it. <laughs>